happy when I get to go to that. Great. Welcome, everybody. We're so happy to have you here for Budding Gardeners Winter Veggies. My name is Denise Reagan. I'm the Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And we are so happy to have White Harvest Farms and Clear White Mission here with us today. This uh, program is uh, brought to you by um, a very generous grant from the Jesse Fulton Pond Fund, where we could not do programs like this without their assistance, and so we're very grateful to them. We're also very grateful to Chanel Lee, who was just here a minute ago. She is our chair for the Budding Gardens program. She's one of our newest members of the Board of Trustees and uh, a great uh, floral designist. Um, you should definitely, definitely check out her work. I'm sure she will give you a card. Um, before we get started with today's program, I wanted to let you know about the next Budding Gardeners program, which is coming up next month on December 11th, and it is called Natural Holidays, and it's going to be an all-craft extravaganza using natural materials, and uh, you'll be able to make some cool things to take home and to either give as gifts to your family or decorate your home with, so sign up for that. Uh, if you are not a member of the Garden Club of Jacksonville, it's a good time to become a member. We would love to have you. And we can uh, share that information with you on the, at the back at the uh, registration table. Or you can scan this code um, either on the screen or we have uh, that available as a QR code in back. Today we're going to be breaking out into three groups after the uh, beginning presentation. There's a planting activity that will happen out in the parking lot. It may rain, so we are going to like adjust if that happens. So we're keeping a close eye on that, so no worries. Um, there's a crafting exercise that's out on the front porch and a tasting that will happen right here in the ballroom. And if it does start to rain, we're gonna go directly into the tasting program and just do that all together here. And that will give us time to adjust. There's also games and snacks out in the uh, courtyard afterward as well. I saw somebody clapping, that makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if, if you have questions, questions for our um, presenters today, today uh, please um, raise your, your hand. I will come up to you with the microphone, microphone and uh, that way you can get recorded um, so that, that uh, you know, we get your question on, on, the, on the air, as it were. All right, so without much ado, I'm going, going to switch over and replace my spotlight, spotlight with Harmony and Sarah. Sarah. So happy, happy to, to have, have them, them and take it away. Yeah, yeah, thank you for having us. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay. Cool. Um, I'm not used to a microphone. Um, so I'm Sarah Salvatore. I'm uh, the lead farmer at White Harvest Farms. White Harvest Farms are located up on the north side of Jacksonville off of Montreat. Um, we are part of the Claire White Mission. So I'm sure you, many of you have heard the Claire White Mission. Um, so I'm there, I do all the planting, seeding, the planning for all of that, uh, youth engagement workshops is kind of my role. Uh, I want to introduce also Harmony. Hi, my name is Harmony Salvatore. I am the volunteer education coordinator for White Harvest Farm. Good morning, everyone. Can I get a good morning? Good morning! <laughs> it's, great. it's great to be here. We're very excited. Um, yeah, and I also want to introduce our chef, uh, Dakota White, this is Chef Henry. <laughs> I keep nervous. Uh, okay. Um, I am the chef at uh, Fair White Mission, and we prepare food for the home. We have to prepare food for pets that live in the facility. Uh, we find them home, we make sure they get jobs, and they can go out and take care of themselves, and they are uh, doing very well. We can house 20 vets at a time. At the mission, we also have a, another place called a public house where the female vets stay, and they all they do the same thing. We take care of them, we feed them three times a day, uh, a very nutritious meal, and uh, so far it's going good. And we also feed about 165 to 200 homeless people every day, except for Thursday and Friday. Uh, they come in from uh, 8 30 Eastern until 10. So we have 90 minutes to feed them and, uh, and give them a nice cold drink. And we also provide groceries for people who don't have food at home. So we have canned goods, we have uh, seafood, meats, uh, produce, and 
99% of our produce that we use at Michigan comes from White House Farm, which uh, Sarah is in charge of growing, and she do a very good job. <laughs> so uh, that's all I have, and uh, I'll give you a presentation soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Should we give a round of applause for Sarah and the mission? <laughs> All right, so why are we from? Again, we're a better white mission program. Uh, Jacoby Pinnon grew up on the north side, side, and she really saw the need uh, to revitalize that area and to bring it back up to what it was. And she, um, when Eartha White, so Eartha White, first of all, uh, is the daughter of Claire White. She was someone who gave a lot of her time to help other people. She helped little kids like you guys at a boys' improvement club, uh, gave them the opportunity to play sports with each other, things like that. Um, she also had a spring-fed swimming pool on site where the farm is, um, as well as what they called an old folks home back in the day for people that were retiring or elderly that needed help and assistance. So um, the land, of course, was then owned by Eartha White, and then we had this land in here, and we saw that the north side had a need for food, vegetables. Um, they don't have a lot of grocery stores there, and that's called a food desert. So when there's not a lot of options for people to get healthy fruits and vegetables. It's called a food desert community. So people like us come in and we start farming programs uh, where we can grow food for that community and then offer it to them at a low pay or a low rate. Or we also do donations, like you said, to the Claire White Mission as well. We do annual uh, produce giveaways for the community. Um, so White Harvest Farms is, we're about 10 and a half acres. It's kind of hard to imagine that size, but really, really big. Um, we're farming maybe the size of this whole property right now is the size that we're actively farming, uh, probably from the street to where the, where, where the river is. Um, we're currently a um, one and a half, one and three quarter acre property. Yeah, so. that's, about, yeah that's, that's a good size. size. That's what we're actively farming. And it also includes our market building, our high tunnel, things like that. It's probably about two acres total. So, so we, we do education there. there. Um, yeah, yeah, we have education there, and that means that we do workshops. We teach people how to garden and how to grow like we are here today. Um, we also teach people what weeds you can pick in your backyard and eat them and kind of the benefit that gives you. Some weeds in your yard actually can make you healthy and strong. They can help your immune system. They can make your brain work better. Um, they can give you more energy. So we teach people how to forage for things that already are growing naturally. Uh, we also do a lot of research. We learn how to grow vegetables really well in Florida, how to make the soil healthy. Um, that's a big part of what we do. And then also, of course, we have field trips, community garden that we started recently. People from the community, again, if they don't have access to fresh produce, they can actually come to our farm and they can grow those foods for free and they can take it home and feed their community. So we charge nobody any money and they come in and we give them the seedlings, we teach them all the knowledge and they get to then harvest and share it. So really cool program we have. And how many of you knew that you could eat weeds? Can I get a raise of hands? Did any of you know that? Oh, very nice. <laughs> and you are welcome to come volunteer on the farm if you would like. And I have another question for you. How many of you know what organic means? Can someone tell me what that they think that means? <laughs> That's yeah, right. No pesticides. Very good. Any other any other thoughts about whether it's organic? What does organic mean? Okay, All well, right. we will tell you. <laughs> so organic gardening. So at the farm, we do organic gardening. And what my friend Kendall here said is that we don't use pesticides. So organic gardening means it involves a natural process. We let things exist naturally. So we do as little input as we have to as, as adults. Um, we try to let you know, things grow like they do in the forest through a natural process. And organic farming, what it does is it feeds the soil and not the plant. So when you think of commercial farming, commercial farms grow produce using chemicals and they feed that plant and that plant takes up those chemicals to grow. In organic farming, the produce relies on the soil and all the organisms and all the little bugs and critters in there to make the nutrients for them to grow the plant. So you can go to the next slide. So uh, why is that important? 
of course, what we said is that this supports what we call the soil food web. So just like above ground, we have people and we have plants and animals and trees. Underground, they also have organisms. They have broken down little twigs and little leaves and they have bacteria and fungi, uh, little insects that then eat all that stuff and they turn that into food for the plant. So when we put chemicals on the soil, what do you guys think happens to all that life in the soil when we are dumping chemicals on there to feed our plants? Do you think that those organisms like that? No? Yeah, probably not. So all these, all these chemicals that we're farming with, like these synthetic fertilizers, synthetic just means that it's not naturally derived. It's something that man had to create. Um, so when we say organic, we means again, it's something that you can find outside at any time. It's a plant or an animal byproduct. That means that it can be poop, it can be your manure, it could be your leaves, it can be your wood chips, um, all your food scraps. That is what feeds plants. Uh, chemicals, again, they're harmful to those, to those microorganisms. And because those microorganisms are feeding that plant, right, so then making that plant really healthy. And then when you're eating that, you're eating all that health. And then that's really important. So when we disrupt that cycle and we eliminate those organisms, that plant is not as healthy. So when you're eating it, it's not as healthy for you. And so conventional farming, what we think is that, you know, it harms that soil life, which harms that plant life, which harms human life. So it's really important to just create a natural system. We can go to the next slide. Okay. So right now we're going to talk about the soil food web. So it's kind of small. Farmer Sarah was talking about how everything has a cycle. Everything in nature has a cycle, right? You have winter, you have spring, you have summer and fall. So just like the other cycles in nature, soil also has a cycle. So see these little critters at the bottom? These are actually friends of the soil. Now, not all of these you can see with your eyes. We can see bugs with our eyes, right? But there are even smaller bugs that you can see that are kind of like germs, right? You know that germs are real and that they exist, but you can't see them. And that's the same with a lot of these microbes that are in the soil. You have fungi, bacteria, protozoas, all different types of little critters that help the soil. So what they do is they eat all those food scraps and all the little things that you're putting in the soil to make it healthy. They're eating those and they're breaking them down into nutrients. And what are nutrients? Do they give your body vitamins? Is that what you, how you get them from plants? So these little friends in the soil, they go and they eat up everything and then they bring the nutrients to the plant, see through the roots, and then the plant takes them up along with the sun to create a beautiful and healthy plant for everybody to eat. And so that's what our goal is at the farm is to create healthy soil that creates healthy plants that create healthy people. Anything else that I missed here? Uh, yeah, and then, you know, just again, that cycle. So then what happens when you eat that plant or that plant dies and it, you know, falls? It turns again back into food for those microorganisms that again feed that. So it's just a cycle that continues, whereas chemicals, you put them on one time a year. Um, you have to keep reapplying, reapplying because they constantly need this. We don't have to, in organic farming, uh, use chemicals because the organic matter will then just continually cycle and make new food and new food and new food all the time. All right. So we're going to talk about a few little tips, uh, steps for a successful organic gardening. So what are some things you think a plant needs to grow? We, we talked about some of them. Does a plant need like sun to grow? Probably. So we need sun and we need water. Water is really important. Plants can't grow without water. Um, so the first thing, if you want to start a garden, you need to think about your yard. Where is the sunniest spot? Where is the spot that's close to water? Um, is your hose, can you reach it? Um, you want to think about high ground versus low ground because plants don't like to be in a pond. Uh, the plants, at least the, the annual vegetables that we're going to be growing and talking about today, they don't like to have wet feet. They don't like to sit in wet soil. Um, they can't do their job. So you want to have your garden in a high spot. You want to have it in full sun, easy to access with water. 
you want to make it so you can access it from all sides, which means that if you grew a plant, like say a cabbage in the middle and you can't reach it, you're less likely to harvest it, less likely to take care of it. So make it easy and accessible for you. Uh, you can also do raised beds. So that's a good strategy if you don't want to grow in ground. Raised bed and you can fill that with compost, what we talked about, which is just food scraps, leaves, mulch, things like that that are broken down. Um, today at the planting, we'll show you what some of the compost looks like that we make and, and identify some of the things in it. So one thing, if you want to do an in-ground garden, uh, you want to get all the weeds out. Weeds will compete with the crop to eat the, uh, the nutrients up. So, and they will use up the water and the resources. Just like if I had a bowl of candy and there was 10 kids, you all are just going to get a little bit. But if there's two kids, those two kids are going to get all that candy. So you want more candy and less plants. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it, right? So you want to have your plants free of all these other weeds and competition that are going to steal their food. Uh, so you want to weed your garden. You want to make sure that your soil is really loose. You don't want the plant to have to work overtime and have to make sure that they're trying really hard to spread their roots out. You want to make it easy for them to talk to the micronutrient or the microorganisms and ask for what they need. Uh, the other thing is too, is that if you don't want to immediately just start planting, you could do a passive approach to gardening. So I like to, this is kind of a method I like to use. Um, and we do this here on the farm is that maybe you have an area you say this is going to be my garden spot but i don't want to dig the weeds out you can put it under tarp you can also put cardboard down and wood chips that will break down and feed the soil so you could do it in a slow way it might take you a year to start a garden but it actually will do a lot more work for your soil because it's going to be breaking down all that material and turning into rich soil for the food so a passive way is to something to consider if you have some time and you want to do more of a natural organic process rather than digging the soil just think about building it up, uh, putting some wood chips on, suppress the weeds, but build soil at the same time. I have to push it again. Oh, I'm kind of missing there. It's okay. I think I talked, so soil and bed prep, I think I talked mostly about that. Um, a couple other things to think about is that plants, again, they like to have water. And in Florida, you know, we get water, but we also, it's really hot. And our soils are really sandy, which means that water doesn't stay in the soil very long. It kind of, you know, leaks out a lot. So one of the things you could do is you can add material on top of your garden bed around your plants that will not only feed the soil, but keep it moist and cool. So you can add straw, uh, you can add broken down wood chips, you can add leaves from your garden, something to cover the soil that will help suppress weeds it also will build the organic matter, and then it's also going to keep your soils moist and wet. So that's a really good tip. Seed starting. Why do you think you would start a seed in a tray instead of just putting it right in the ground? Anyone? Well, I can tell you. <laughs> seed starting <laughs> is in a tray like this happens because seedlings are like babies. They're a little bit weaker. They're a little bit smaller. They need some extra attention so that they can grow strong and grow into a healthy plant that will create vegetables and fruit. And so by starting them in the seed trays, you can start them a little bit earlier, get them to where they need to be before you put them in the ground to make sure that they have everything they need prior to starting, you know, produce plants. Sorry about that. Um, what else? So some simple steps that you can do, uh, you know, you want to get good organic potting mix. Um, always start from organic. Uh, you don't want to add anything that has chemicals in it. So you want to start with just an, or an all-purpose seed starting mix. We recommend something called ProMix. Um, so look for organic, look for something that says seed starting. Seedlings don't want to have a lot of wood chips and a lot of hard things to grow. They want very kind of loose, fluffy soil. Um, so make sure you start with seed starting mix. And then also you can throw in your little, you can make your own pots. You can just get pots from the store. We have styrofoam trays, lots of options. Um, but the first rule of, rule of thumb always is to wet your potting medium. So when you got your potting soil, sometimes it has clumps in it and it's really dry. Wet it down to a good like medium moisture. 
break up all those clumps, fill your trays first, and then poke little holes, you know, where you want your seed to go. And we like to do one seed per hole. It saves your seed. Seed's expensive. And it's also, um, to me, I think it's a, it's a really sacred commodity that we have as seeds and to preserve them. So don't throw a whole bunch in one hole and then you waste a lot. Um, so that's a good tip. Also, why, why would you wet it down? Have any of you in school put a seed into a wet paper towel? Have any of you done that in school yet? Well, a lot of times that's done in schools to experiment so that you can see little seedlings. And so adding moisture to the soil helps that little seedling in this little pod grow out and become a little baby. Exactly. And so during that cycle, you want to make sure that your soil is always staying wet. You don't want your seeds to, to dry out. If the seed starts to germinate, what it means it creates this little root and then it dries out, it will not be able to survive. So you want to always make sure that your potting medium is, is wet during the growing cycle. And then also, most seedlings, when you grow them in pots, I recommend um, for your vegetables, this is for vegetables particularly, is that at least three weeks um, in the cell. And if sometimes if you start in your little pot and it looks a little small, but maybe the roots, some plants grow a lot of roots and they need more space, you can just bump it up in another pot you could keep doing that until you think the plant is a good size to put out. A good rule of thumb is that every plant should have at least two sets of true leaves. Um, so we'll, I'll show you today that our plants, every plant starts with um, an initial leaf called a cotyledon. And that is the leaf it needs, all the nutrients and all the, all the things that make it uniquely what it is, it's in those leaves. So it uses all that resources. It's kind of like the fertilizer for the first few weeks for the plant they're gonna use that up and those are gonna fall off and then you'll see the true leaves emerge. And so always say at least two sets of true leaves. So that means it's usually about four leaves on your plant before you plant it out. So that way it can handle the wind, it can handle the heavy rain, it can handle the heat, things like that. It's just a stronger plant. All right, so sometimes you start things by plants and sometimes you just put a seed in the ground so a reason for that is some plants will grow kind of a web of roots. So their little plant might have a spider web of roots and some plants will have just one center root called a tap root. So when you have a carrot, for example, like this, all a carrot is is a root. So it's just a tap root, a main stem, has all these little hairs that come off of it. If I were to start a carrot in a tray and I were to try to plant that in the ground and say maybe I broke that tap root or bent it a little bit, it actually won't grow at all. Uh, tap roots, if you damage that one root, they can't transplant well. They can't. That means transplanting means when you take a plant from a pot and you put it in the ground. So some things you want to direct sow right into the ground, and those are going to be like your carrots, uh, any root vegetables, your turnips, your radishes. Uh, beets are an exception to the rule. We do them in pots at the, at the farm, but you can also put them right into the soil. And so those things, again, they just don't do well planting. They prefer to start in the soil. And so when you're direct sowing, you have your nice little soil. You want to have it nice and flat. You want to remove all those weeds and all those twigs and rocks, anything that's going to make the plant not be able to grow. Um, again, a little tiny seed. It doesn't want any competition. So make that soil nice and fluffy. And then, again, another rule is... Um, you want to make sure that soil, again, stays moist like you would from seeding. Until that plant emerges, then you can kind of back off on the watering like you would normally water. But up until when that thing germinates, I would water it every day unless the rain comes. And so for planting and for direct sowing, on every seed packet on the back, it tells you the days of harvest. That means how many days it will take from when you put the seed in the ground to when you can eat it. So that's something to look at. Also, it will tell you how to space the plant. Do you want to put this seed two inches apart or do you want it four inches apart? Things like that. So really your rule is just to read whatever's on the seed packet. It'll tell you how to plant it and also how to direct sow it. So some crops, again, that are good, like your, your carrots, any kind of lettuce you can direct sow, radishes, turnips, and all the other crops, your broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. Um, you want to just go ahead and start in a pot and just give that plant some time, especially tomatoes, peppers, slower growers, especially start in a pot. That way you can get them nice and strong and healthy. And so garden maintenance, again, a plant needs water. And so 
If you see droopy leaves, if your plant looks really sad, it probably wants water. Um, if your plant looks yellow and it's looking sad, but it's also showing yellow and the plants are kind of wilty looking, it probably is too much water, want to back off. Um, plants are resilient, meaning that they can bounce back from hard times sometimes. So just watch your watering. Um, and then also you want to amend. This means that during your growing season, you want to check to see, is my plant changing colors? It shouldn't be. Maybe I need to add more fertilizer because of that. Um, maybe I need to add more compost. We say compost is fertilizer. So um, we want to add more compost if your plant looks purple or yellow or weird spots. You want to watch out for your pests, your bugs. So bugs are opportunists in the way that they are going to look for the easiest place to eat. They're going to look for the weakest plants. They are going to look for um, a cool place, a dry place. So oftentimes you're going to find bugs on the underside of your leaves because they're out of the elements. They're not going to be um, available for a bird to come down and eat the caterpillar. The caterpillar is going to be on the underside of the leaves so the bird can't see it. But that caterpillar is going to be eating your plant. So what should you do? You should try to remove it from your plant. Check the leaves. If you see eggs, you could take them off and remove them or even smash them. I know that sounds bad, but they're going to eat up your plant. So if you don't feel comfortable smashing things, I don't feel comfortable even though I do this all day long, put them all in a bucket. So if you go around your yard and you can collect all the little bugs, but you need to know what is a good guy and what is a bad guy uh, for your plant. So I don't have any pictures. I should maybe next time consider that, but um, maybe ask mom and dad, what, you know, do you think this is a good bug? Do you think this is a bad bug? Caterpillars are probably going to eat up anything that they're on. Um, Leaf-footed bugs, harlequins, aphids as tiny little, little bugs that live on stems and young leaves. So good places to check on a plant is going to be the underside of the leaves. You're going to look for new growth because new growth is the weakest growth um, because it's just getting started. So you want to look for that. You want to look at places on your plant that might be low to the ground, uh, that are damp, shady. That's where pests thrive. So you want to go out and make sure that no one else is eating the food that you want to eat. Um, and actually, the plant sends out signals if it isn't healthy enough. It'll say, okay, bugs, I'm going to die now. You can come and eat me. <laughs> but, you know, if you use compost or you give the plant extra nutrients, you can get the pest to go away instead of using pesticides. And so that's why healthy soil is so important so that the plant doesn't say, okay, I'm ready to go. It can actually grow and be healthy and create vegetables for us. Yeah. Kind of like plants are like people. The healthier we are, the less likely we are to get sick. So plants are the same way. If we can start with healthy soil, make the plant healthy, the less likely they're going to die from pests, the less likely they're going to get a disease um, or something like that. So the healthier you can get your plant, the less likely that something's going to eat it. And another good thing to, to say is that um, you can also feed the bugs in your garden. So we call this integrative pest management. But basically what it means is that you're planting things for bugs to eat that you're not eating. So we like to plant flowers, uh, buckwheat, um, sunflowers, mustard greens. Maybe you have an abundance of mustard green seeds. You can plant a patch in your yard and then all the harlequin bugs are gonna go over there and eat those mustard greens. And when you find them in your garden, you could take them over there because bugs are like us and they're gonna communicate with each other. And they're gonna say, hey, this is a really great spot. They're not bothering us. This plant's yummy and healthy and you can get the bugs to go over there. And then also a way to control bugs is to think everything has something that eats it. So maybe not humans, you know, we're an exception to this, but everything has something. So if you have a certain type of bug, you can invite in birds by bringing bird houses in um, or other little critters that are gonna eat those little bad guys. Praying mantises eat other bugs. So they can be helpful for your garden. So it's just about creating a healthy ecosystem. Instead of you doing the work of having to kill the bugs, just invite the other guys in who need them to eat, who need them to thrive. So that's a good thing to consider. Lots of flowers, grow a couple plants for them. And that goes back to everything is a cycle, right? Yeah. If you're bringing birds in or other things that will eat the bugs, then that's also a form of a, na a natural cycle. All right, so last thing. So after you grow this beautiful garden and you want to harvest your food, a good rule of thumb is always have clean hands. Your hands are full of germs. Um, so when you touch that plant, you make it sick. If you 
cut a leaf off and that little stem is exposed when you touch it, you might be introducing a bacteria to it that could harm it. Wear gloves or clean your hands. Clean the tools that you use. Also, um, plants are best harvested in the morning. So interesting, plants at nighttime take, or during the daytime, plants are just soaking in the rays, you know, soaking everything up. And at night they do their growing. So they send all the nutrients, you know, or send all their resources back down into the soil. They're growing, doing all their stuff. And then during the day, all that water comes up. Everything comes up to make this plant to be able to withstand the day. And so you want to harvest first thing in the morning because that plant is juiciest. It's not going to wilt, which means that your leaves aren't going to get mushy and gross. Um, and it's just going to have the best flavor first thing in the morning. We harvest first thing in the morning, 8 o'clock every day on the farm. Um, or if you can't, you can harvest, you know, midday, kind of after the harsher sun. Some things are okay to harvest whenever, but I like first thing in the morning. Same rule for watering. That's a good thing. It's the water in the morning or water in the evening if there's enough hours of sunlight to dry up the leaves because water introduces bacteria and, and, and fungi like molds and, and um, different kind of diseases to the plant. So the plant prefers to have drier leaves. But back to harvesting. So after you harvest, you want to clean your, your produce. Some things want to be cleaned, your leafy greens. Clean them immediately. Don't just sit them on your counter, put them in the fridge and clean them later. They actually benefit from being cleaned right away. It'll, it'll help maintain their moisture and their freshness. So after you clean your produce, you want to spin it dry, your lettuce or your greens, or you want to pat it dry. You don't want to store it in a wet bag. Again, it will make bacteria grow or introduce kind of, it will just get soggy. So make sure it's dry. Uh, some things you wouldn't wash, uh, things like okra that we talked about earlier, um, beans, things like that, uh, tomatoes you don't need to wash until you use them, um, as well as things like peppers, eggplant, things like that. We don't really wash them. You could just wash them before use, but all your leafy vegetables, definitely give them a good wash. Also, things you store in the refrigerator, stop putting your tomatoes in the fridge. <laughs> it just will make their flavor way better uh, to let them be on the shelf. Of course, if you want to stop them from ripening, put them in the fridge. Uh, you're not going to want to put your winter squash, your hard shell squash in the fridge. That would actually decline them. Eggplant's a tricky one. Um, I say wrap things in bags really tight, airtight for things like that. Um, zucchini, you know, the same thing. I would put it in the fridge, but Sometimes people have drawers that are temperature controlled. You can make one warmer. That's really nice. I don't have that. I wish I did. But yeah, I just say put everything in an airtight and dry. The drier you can get the produce in an airtight container, the longer it's going to last. Once moisture is introduced, you take it half. You cut the time in half for how long you can maintain produce. Sometimes what I'll do is actually take it out once a week and dry it off from the water that's been released and, and you know, make sure it's it back in a dry bag. And my, I've had my produce last up to four weeks, like produce from the farm or from the farmer's market. I've had it last quite a while by just maintaining it like that. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so paper towels, that's a good method. You could put a paper towel in there, especially for. Yeah. Oh, that's, see, that's okay. Smart. Um, I would recommend for washing your leafy greens. Yeah. But for your squash and cucumbers, things like that, you don't have to. It's honestly preference. I don't wash those things at the farm. We sometimes do because we're selling them to clients. Um, but yeah, leafy greens are the one thing you just want to wash before you store. They're going to do way better. And they're going to soak up some of that moisture. In case you harvest it, it's really, really hot. You're, it's going to start wilting. You want to introduce moisture back into the, the produce. But that's a great strategy, putting in a paper towel or, or what Harmony said, which is just checking it weekly and drying them off. Things like radishes and turnips, you can actually store in fridges for three to four months if you properly store them. And that is really maintaining a dry produce. Um, another way to store things is that you can dehydrate them in a dehydrator. If you don't have a dehydrator, just put them in your oven at a low, low temperature, like kind of the 150 setting, this kind of standard uh, temperature for most ovens, and just let them kind of slowly suck out all that water. And you can do that with tomatoes, um, figs, fruit, citrus, herbs, all kinds of things you can dry, or you can can and freeze. 
freezing is going to be your number one thing to lock in all the nutrients. So if you're really focused on how much nutrients can I get out of this, um, I would go with freezing. Freezing is going to lock in the produce, all the nutrients a lot better than um, canning. Canning will kind of, the cooking process will take some of those out. Um, but of course, canning. So that's a great option too. Um, and there's lots of, uh, lots of great places. I know the extension office offers a canning uh, class, so you can take that down there. We also do dehydrating classes at the farm, so we can show you kind of the process to do that. All right. Okay, so the time to grow is now. We actually have quite a few different times of the year um, to plant, which is September, October, November, and December. Um, that is when you can start planning so that you can have produce year round. So if you notice from the list, broccoli, I think, is on all of the lists or at least three of them, which means that you can plant broccoli multiple times a year so that you can have broccoli from your garden year round if you wanted, which is really great. You know, that's one blessing that we have of living here in Florida is that it's, it's warm often, um, but we still have cooler times here in, you know, North Florida, of course so that we can have all these wonderful produce um, available to us from our garden. There's quite a bit on the list. It's a little too far away for me to read, <laughs> um, but there is okra, cabbage, um, you know, so these are things that you'll wanna be mindful of because broccoli plants, for instance, they produce a lot of heads of broccoli. You know what heads of broccoli look like? They look like trees, right? But then a cabbage will just have one cabbage on the whole plant. So you may want to plant more cabbages if you plan to make something like slaw or sauerkraut, things like that. So those are things to consider when you're growing your produce. Um, what else is so, on that list that you think is interesting? For yeah, Sarah? so with uh, winter vegetables, like September through December is kind of what we consider like a fall and winter. Um, and well, that goes all the way until I think January. This is for times you would plant them. So you will be harvesting in winter, but you know you wouldn't start winter vegetables in January just because in Florida we heat up in March and sometimes those plants might not want to go all the way through their cycle. They might produce early, which is gonna give you a young plant, like a young piece of broccoli that's smaller than normal. Um, interesting what Harmony said is so broccoli, a lot of people, one plant gives you one thing. Once you cut that main head off, actually the plant will shoot up a whole bunch of other little broccoli heads. So leave your plant on the ground, it's not done. Same thing with most cauliflowers. Uh, cauliflower is a tricky one. It, it depends on the type of cauliflower you have, but that will also send up side shoots. So you can harvest that a lot. Um, what Harmony was saying, like with a long growing cycle means that I can plant my broccoli in September and December, and I can plant it maybe in January. You can keep planting it, which means that I could harvest that broccoli for three months rather than just one month. You don't have to plant a crop and then just harvest it once. You can continually plant successions. It's called successional planting. So also you have to consider the plants that need. Uh, so in the springtime, we have the longest days, right? It's, it's warm all the time. The days are long. You, you don't see the sun going down at six o'clock. Uh, so those plants do well with really long days. These crops here can handle shorter days of sunlight. So that's your, again, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the collard greens, the mustard greens, these are called brassicas. So when you think of fall and winter, I want you to think brassicas. Do as many brassicas as you can. Um, yes, your beets, all kinds of things like that, radish, turnips, all those cool root vegetables. And then when it starts to get cold, like right here in November, when we don't see many days above like 75, 80, you can start to think about doing carrots. So carrots are my all-time favorite thing to grow. I don't know why. I think it's the most rewarding thing to pull a carrot from the ground. And maybe for me, being from the north, our soils are very rocky, and carrots like to be able to go into the ground really easy. Um, so the carrots here are beautiful and straight and, and just great. So in November, start thinking about late, you know, early November, late October, putting carrots in the ground. Um, you can also do things like Swiss chard, green onions, Really, almost anything you want to eat, you can grow in the fall in Florida. However, you need to think about things that can't handle the cold. Some plants like broccoli and collard greens can handle um, the cold. They can handle a little bit of a frost, but some things like tomatoes won't survive. Um, peppers won't survive. They're going to die as soon as that freeze hits them. 
they're going to wilt and be done. To them, it signals that the season's over. Um, so that's something to consider too. Usually your seed packs are going to tell you when to plant this. But again, you want to look for what zone we're in. I think everyone probably knows we're in zone 9A. Uh, you can also get away with zone 9B, depending on where you're at in Jack's. Um, if you're closer to the shore, you can get away with a lot of zone 9B or even 10A kind of planting. But really, you're going to think of those leafy greens, those dark, rich vegetables. That's your great winter, uh, winter vegetable. And again, like the, the tip about harvesting. So collard greens and kale. You don't want to just grow a big plant and cut it down. What you want to do is grow the plant, let those leaves get as big as you want them to get, and then start harvesting all the big leaves from the bottom. And then that plant's going to come up and it's going to produce new leaves from the top. And that plant's going to continue to grow. For example, we will have about two or three successions of kale on the farm, but we plant our first round in October and we'll harvest that all the way until January, that same, that same kale plant by taking off the bigger leaves, keep giving it more compost, topping it off, and it's gonna keep producing more and more leaves for you until that plant kind of expires. It tells you when it's done. We also have some perennial things that have stars on there. A lot of herbs, rosemary, thyme, sage, tarragon, those can actually survive for many seasons down here in North Florida. So you only have to plant them once. I like to have, at my own home actually, and on the farm, we have perennial herb gardens where you have herbs year round. So that's a really great thing to consider too. And herbs are really good planted in the fall. They do well at getting established and then they handle the winter well and they can handle the heat of the spring. And then things like um, garlic and potatoes. When I think of garlic, it, it's definitely October, you know, or November. Pushing it, you know, you wanna get it established before that cold comes in. Onions, again, at the farm, we always do onions right after Thanksgiving. That's kind of our rule. Um, because they tend to bolt, which means that they want to throw out seeds early if it starts to warm up really quickly. So we like to get ours in about around Thanksgiving and harvest them, you know, March, April, things like that. Um, I wouldn't push those any further planting past November. Uh, we've tested on the farm and they produce small onions um, because they're just ready to go on with themselves. And so those are a couple of things to consider. Uh, a good time also to plant citrus right now is, is, is in the winter. Plant trees when they're dormant is kind of a good rule of thumb and then uh, fertilize them in the spring when they're coming out of dormancy. It's just gonna stress the plant a lot less. When you transplant something that has fruit on it already or is, is trying to ripen, it just stresses them out because they have a lot of responsibilities to produce this fruit. And when you're planting them, when they're fruiting, it just, they have to work too hard to establish their roots and also produce their fruit. So you want to do it in dormancy when they're just kind of hanging out, which is right now winter. Plant your berries, your fruit trees, things like that. And back to what Sarah said about collard greens and kale, the, the image pictured here is actually collard greens. And that's what she was talking about, how you can cut some of it off and still have some left. So they still have them on the farm, even though we have collards and kale for you to try today that the chef has prepared for us. So that's something interesting that you can look forward to. You get to try these vegetables and know that we still have more of the farm to use. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, that middle picture. So grow in the spring, harvest in the summer and fall, and then store in the winter. So what you're seeing here on the screen are seminal pumpkins and sweet potatoes. So these items actually can be stored for months at a time in a dry and cool, dark area in your home. So maybe in a closet or something like that. Um, or if you have a temperature controlled garage area, or perhaps like a brown you can bag. store those. Brown bags would help. Seminal pumpkins, you can make pumpkin pie out of, you could make bread, you can make soups. I made a wonderful seminal pumpkin soup last week. It was delicious. And seminal pumpkins are actually native to Florida, which means that they originated here. That's what native means. So those are some of the things that we have yeah. available. And then Roselle hibiscus is actually the cranberry of the South. So what's really great about those is they're high in vitamin C. They are very interesting on the outside. I've never seen anything like them. Have you? <laughs> they look funny, don't they? 
So these, these hibiscus, so they're great for, um, you can make teas out of them, you can dehydrate them, which means you take all of the water out and then it just looks like a dried leaf, like when leaves fall off of the tree, that when they become dry, that's how, what dehydrating is. So then you can store them in a bag and put them in hot water and it makes them to be like a deep red, kind of like cranberries, like cranberry juice, if you've had that. So that's why it's similar to cranberries is because of the vitamin C as well as its deep, rich red color. And so these usually um, start producing in the fall. They create a flower and then the flower actually will fall off and it becomes that bulb that you're seeing, that red bulb. And then we just cut those off the plant and peel them away and it has a little seed in the inside. And so we put those in our compost and we've seen squirrels eat them. So, you know, the plant itself is beneficial to humans and to other creatures in nature. And so they're just a really fun plant to have. They are a little bit prickly. Um, they don't hurt too bad, but they will sting you a little bit just because they have these like fine little hairs. And the bees really love them as well because they have lots of pollen and things for them to store to make their honey. And then also, uh, so the cranberry in the south, so we make a jam at the farm with this plant, the oh, Rosella yeah. hibiscus. So um, you can turn that into a cranberry sauce of sorts for your Thanksgiving table. So I definitely recommend um, people trying cranberry or trying the Rosella hibiscus. Also, it's called Jamaican sorrel. You've heard that. Um, it's great to plant kind of uh, in the spring. And then it's going to produce in the late, late summer, early fall, even into the winter. You can plant it really into the, the summer months. Um, kind of grows like okra. So real big. It's, it's related to the okra. So um, it's a great plant. And I'm, I'm going to make some at my, uh, my table this year with some, uh, I think, orange and ginger and, and kind of make it into a nice jam. So it's a good substitute. Some other things I wanted to mention with what you can grow in the spring that you're gonna eat this time of year is, is again that winter squash. So your seminal pumpkin, you're gonna grow your butternuts, your uh, spaghetti squash, all those hard shell squash. You can grow them in the spring, harvest in the summer and store for later. Um, and, this, and your potatoes, the same thing, you're gonna plant kind of late spring, let them grow all summer, harvest them in the fall. And the, um, the roselle, we actually have a recipe from Farmer Mallory at the farm oh, yeah. in Edible, Florida. So if you wanted to check out the recipe to have at your uh, Thanksgiving table, feel free to do so. Uh, so some roselle or some hibiscus you can root from cuttings. I have not tried the roselle, but I, I imagine you could. Um, cause a lot of hibiscus here in the South is perennial and you can root it from cuttings, but I will check on that. Yeah. Yeah. So come visit us. We are on the farm, uh, Tuesday through Saturday. We have volunteer opportunities Tuesday, Friday, and Saturday. Saturday is our workshop day. We have workshops every Saturday, um, in composting. We teach you how to make good food for your soil. Uh, we have an introduction to organic gardening, which is much more in depth than what we did here today. Um, that herbal tea one, and we do permaculture, rotational things. We also have a farm stand where you can come buy our produce. Also, we carry honey from the Urban Life. Uh, she's there every Saturday. We have a community garden if you're interested in getting involved in growing your own food. Uh, we have a lot of kids that are a part of that, so you can come and grow food and take it home. Um, and then, of course, we do events like this. So if your schools are interested in farm tours, uh, engagement like that, we're, we're open to that as well. And we want to give you a round of applause. Thank you for yeah. being such great listeners today. <laughs> We're so excited about the activities that we have coming up. So thank you for being here. Yeah. All right. Did anybody have any questions? I can bring the microphone over to you so you can ask a question. Yes, you have a question? <laughs> that was good. Do you have to hand pick the hibiscus cranberries when you guys get ready to harvest? We hand pick it. Do you hand pick? Yeah, them? we do. We actually always have it as a volunteer activity because it takes a lot of time to harvest. Um, 
I have just two plants at home and I got probably four or five gallons dehydrated of the hibiscus off of just two plants. And it takes a long time to harvest. And, but it's a great thing to store. You could dehydrate, you could freeze it. It tastes a lot like Kool-Aid for kids. So it's a great alternative. It's really worth it. But you have to individually harvest it. Uh, it's really easy to collect seed from too. If you leave a few on there till the plant dies, you can harvest for the seed and plant it next year. I have a big whiskey barrel that I grow lettuce in. Nice. Do I have to change the soil every time I want to grow something new? I would I've say- I've already had good soil to begin with. Yeah, you know, for, for us, we top the plants off like once a year. So we have a, a barrel we're, we're growing in. For example, I would just once a year at the beginning and like in the fall, I consider the growing season September through June in Florida. So really beginning of September, just amend your top of your soil with some compost, add in some fertilizer. If it's a slow release, that's okay. If it's granular, if not, just give it a nice drench with fish emulsion, something like that. But I would recommend just once a season, adding some really good compost in there. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, great question. Any other questions? All right, so let me just make a couple of quick changes here. Um, so I wanna thank, could we all give a big hand to Harmony and Sarah? Um, when you leave, and we'll also send this to you by email afterward, we have a survey that we'll want to give to everybody. We want your feedback about this program. So please um, share, you know, share your uh, feedback with us. It's really important. Um, you can also use the QR code that we'll have um, out for you, and you can scan it with your phone and, and take it just as you leave here today. Um, wanted to let you know about a really cool uh, program that we have coming up in a couple of weeks, the Luminaria Festival. If you're not familiar with the um, uh, Luminaria Festival, the Luminaria Night uh, that Riverside Avondale Preservation does each year, it's a really beautiful, fun event. And the last couple of years, the Garden Club has had a great um, uh, party here as well. And we'll be doing that again this year. It's December 12th. And once again, I want to thank the Jesse Ball DuPont Fund for their um, grants to help fund programs like this. And we're going to break out. I think um, the rain has subsided. We're not going to worry about it. So um, we have three breakout groups that we're going to do. All right. So you should have a number on your name tag. All right. And um, where are... Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm missing a couple of my um, staff members here who should be helping. Um, maybe you can get them out of the... Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to break out into three groups. And uh, one of you will start, one group will start um, with the demonstration of tasting here. One group will go to the craft activity and one group will go to the planting activity. And then you'll all switch. So everybody will get to do all three. And then afterward, we'll all meet in the courtyard for games and snacks. All right. So in just a second, we'll have all the three numbers out here. Are they not in there? OK, they need to come out. OK. <laughs> yes. All right. So um, look for your number and, uh, and follow them to the next uh, activity. All right. Thanks, everybody.